Okay, good morning. Uh, we're about to start the educating the next generation of wound care leaders and talk about global networking. And we're pleased to have Foy White Chu beginning our session. Um, Dr. Chu is uh, going to talk about educating geriatric team members in wound care. And she's going to review some of the examples, um, talk about the challenges and successes uh, in wound care education for geriatric team members. Uh, Dr. Chu will be followed by uh, Pam Scarborough, um, who's the Director of Public Policy and Education um, at American Medical uh, Technologies. Um, and uh, Pam is going to be talking about educating the licensed healthcare provider from an interdisciplinary team perspective um, and talking about how important um, that interdisciplinary uh, collaboration is to the process. And finally, last but not least, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Ennis will be talking um, about uh, giving you a brief introduction to uh, the American College of uh, Wound Healing and Tissue Repair talk about the current wound education model and the future of the field. Boy? I'm, I'm Lisa Gould and I'm co-moderating this session. I wanted to give you an, a perspective of why we're doing this is we're going from educating the generalist to educating people who are seeing wounds all the time and it's really part of their livelihood and then people who are interested in truly making wound care their own specialty. So that gives you an idea of the order of our speakers and um, why we chose who we did. I want to introduce um, Dr. Foy White Chu uh, because many of you won't know her. Um, Foy is an assistant professor at the Oregon Health and Sciences University and um, director of the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship there. She's also medical director um, of wound healing of the wound healing program at the Portland VA. So she wears multiple hats as well as being um, overseeing the PACE program which is um, a, an amputation prevention program that's based at the VA. So as a geriatrician she is really taking care of wounds and I have to commend her for, for what she does. Um, she's developed a chronic wound care curriculum for medical students, residents, and fellows and she's going to tell us how she's incorporated that into her teaching and also a little bit about how to look at outcomes of education. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Okay, let's get started. Oh, oh you're going to do that for me. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, go ahead. Go. Um, so what I want to go over is kind of, it's a little bit of the arc of my career and how I've been building and it by no means is what I do, you know, the exact model, but what I want you to see are some of the trials, tribulations, successes that I've encountered and throughout this really think about, well, how could I apply this at my institution? Um, so. First off, why geriatrics? Because I, you know, I have people who are like, well, you're a geriatrician. Why are you interested in wound care? And they really do come together quite nicely. The vast majority of my patients and all of our patients are living with chronic wounds. They tend to be older and frailer than the general population. And older adults, as many of us know, are the fastest growing population worldwide. So uh, after my geriatric medicine fellowship, I earned a geriatric academic career award, and this protected 75% of my time, which was really fabulous, but I was still seeing a lot of patients, so they say 75%, that doesn't mean I only 25% of the time was seeing patients, was really having to merge seeing patients and doing education with frontline providers. I really loved working with my team members, nurses, certified nursing assistants, physical therapists, and I was working at a long-term chronic hospital in Boston at the time that had three separate campuses. So I was like, well, how, and we've all built these boards, right? How do we get these board, you know, this information just in time? Um, and it really was about partnering, partnering, partnering with the leadership you know, they're like, we can't pay people overtime for you to just do your education project. So really working as to what will work best for them. And so we came with this 
in-between shift change type model. Um, and I also found uh, wound champions, you know, dietitians, physical therapists, et cetera, to co-teach, because you can't be a one-person show. It's just not going to be sustainable. So between having these wound care topics, doing some email blasts of wound tip of the day, um, and these scheduled uh, sessions in between shift change, we were able to give nice bite-sized information just in time. And what I started to notice over the years that I, I did this for about two years, what I noticed is I had frontline providers coming straight to me saying, hey, I just noticed this on this patient. Would you come and look at this with me? Or pulling uh, some of the other team members in. So not only was the education educational, it also started a culture change of every person of the team feeling that we were a part of taking care of the patients. Um, for the nurse practitioners and physicians, maybe did a little bit longer sessions at the bedside, seeing their patients and the ones that they were struggling with to make it meaningful for them. And then I was able to incentivize that with um, continuing medical education credits. So scheduling logistics, as you can imagine, were still quite challenging. I'm teaching at multiple sites, running all over the place. Um, and then optimizing those topics to be uh, in a brief amount of time. Did demonstrate it was feasible. We had over uh, 200 learners over those two years, um, got a lot of positive feedback. And you know, when you're doing your assessment of how well your education work works, the low hanging fruit is satisfaction and confidence. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't check it, but just know that that's not necessarily the goal. And I'll get to that in a moment in terms of how education works. Um, and they really liked how short it was. It was brief, concise, and they could remember it. So um, fast forward a, a few years, i um, been partnering um, with several uh, other colleagues across associations na or national organizations um, where we have done two years in a row now at the American Geriatric Society, a pre-conference. Um, that's a four-hour pre-conference, and it was didactic and skills training. And the first year that we did it, we, did, we tried to study whether there was any kind of behavior change. Um, was very well attended uh, and, the, and found that we would survey them before, and then three months after, even with a $100 gift card raffle, our response rate was really poor. So that was still very quite frustrating. Um, but of those, of the post, um, a good 90% said they would change, and we'll go into the um, details of that. What we used for measurement was a, what's called a clinical vignette. So we had a case, um, and then on a scale from 0 to 10, we asked them different behaviors that they would do typically. So before they got the education from 0 to 10, 0 would be, no, I would never order negative pressure wound therapy for this wound or yes, I would always order it. And we had different kinds of uh, questions alluding to that case. Um, so what we found uh, for this, as you know, again, low response rates, so your p-values you have to take with a grain of salt. Um, but what came out of it, at least for what we did find significance, was that they ordered a topical for wound pain. And it was nice to see that that might have been a really good learning pearl that they got from that um, training. When we looked at the qualitative data, and people really said that they found that they were going to, they felt much more comfortable with debridement, felt empowered because we gave them very simple tools, usually the curette being the simplest in terms of debridement, and also dressing choices. A lot of people said they felt much more empowered to uh, do this before feeling that they had to call in a consultant. Um, and there were a few people who had some barriers to change, and it's always good to try and target those and think about how you change the teaching next time if you could. Um, so the room layout was poor. <laughs> uh, we actually, when we arrived, um, I had to have, as we say in the South, a hissy fit. I am Southern, even though I live in Oregon now. Um, that where it's like, you, it was set out like this, and it was a workshop. I'm like, no, we need separate tables. This will not work. This will die before it starts. And luckily, they, you know, AGS was like, oh. So they put the tables together, and we were able to make it work. Um, still a lot of noise issues. Um, when you look at our evaluations, they said it was too loud. Um, and then that low three-month response rate. But it was highly attended. We had people wanting to come in the door even after we got started. Um, and then that qualitative data showed that there were some changes that people were making. So now um, at my home institution, um, I've taken a chronic wound care curriculum to the internal medicine residents. Um, and this came about because I know firsthand every single intern comes through my clinic. Um, they spend uh, uh, several, you know, either through my clinic or with my long-term care rounds, and they also all say we know nothing about wounds. Please help us because we see these all the time. 
Um, so I and so then the attendings approached me as well, like what can, teaching can you do? So what they have in our particular residency program, they have a practice-based session where once a month they will have a good two, three hours dedicated to hands-on or um, specialized didactic that they then get before they go to their outpatient clinic. So they, it's, it's that my academic institution really prides that quality teaching and sectioning that off. So looking at your institution to see what they've put in as a mechanism um, or an opportunity for you. So again, this was another didactic with skills training, did some debridement, threw out all the dressings, and we threw up cases after we did the didactic, and I had them walk through what they think they would do and what they would choose and why some choices are great and some choices are okay and some choices probably wouldn't work. Did, again, the clinical vignette survey both before and three months after the workshop. Um, again, a really poor response rate on the three-month post, but what I was proud to see was that the, what came out was that ordering that moisture retentive dressing. Think of how much our residents, even our internal medicine residents, are learning about just wet to dry dressings. They don't, you know, if there's just that one thing is a success, and that's a big success. Um, in terms of the qualitative data, more, more people felt like they were making changes in their wound description, and I've anecdotally even seen this in their charting, which I've been really happy to see. Um, but then the barriers to change were really big. Now, some of this could be duh. Like, I could have known that the, what happened when they went into their outpatient clinics, that maybe they didn't have debridement kits, and maybe they didn't have dressings, or that the supervising physician themselves was not going to be comfortable with what the resident suggested as a dressing change. You can make that assumption, but you don't know it until you study it. So this also would kind of served as an assessment of our own clinics and how they were standing at that time. And so when I want to make changes in the future, I'm going to target that first before I roll out another curriculum. Um, again, I kind of went over some of the challenges, again, the low response rate. Um, but this was the first wound care curriculum of its kind, really looking at behavior change. If you look at a lot of the education literature for physicians out there, it looks at confidence and satisfaction in terms of being able to take care of wounds. Very little are actually looking, and maybe a knowledge one every now and then, but very rarely are they looking at any kind of behavior change. And so what I mentioned earlier on that low-hanging fruit when you're doing assessment, confidence, satisfaction, the highest is patient outcome, of course, and maybe some of those interim ones would be knowledge, but even better looking at behavior change on the provider themselves. So the take-home points, um, how our education is rolled out to our frontline providers, look at your clinical institution. Are there some gaps with, you know, you, you're already collecting this data, your pressure ulcer data, post-op surgical complications causing wounds, um, you know, your venous leg ulcers or cellulitis admissions, meeting with those team leaders that can leverage education at your, curric um, your educational curriculum. Um, and then, you know, how do you serve uh, your community locally or nationally or regionally, uh, aligning yourself with other disciplines as we have done to really make this effective education. Um, and then in your own educational institution, collaborating with chief residents or clerkship directors um, and finding out what there might be hidden resources that you don't know and then study it. So like, I, this, these were not perfect studies that I even presented to you today. They're far from perfect. But you have to start somewhere. You gotta get comfortable doing it. It's okay to make mistakes. That's how we learn. And so, but really, just because it's education, it doesn't mean it works. So please take a look to see if it's effective. We're going to, so that you can get the global overview, we're going to save questions for the end, and that way we can have a very interactive discussion, and you'll have an uh, idea of what everybody's doing. So our next speaker is um, Pamela Scarborough, which, um, again, many of you may not be familiar with Pam, and I've known her for quite some time, but it's only been recently that I've realized how much educating she does. She's the Director of um, Public Policy and Education for the American Medical Technologies. She's a physical therapist, and she has greater than 35 years of experience as a clinician, a team leader, a professional education, and a mentor. Uh, she's a certified wound specialist, and she teaches and presents nationally and internationally um, in a multi-specialty audience. So, Pam, let's make sure we've got your right talk up there. 
Thank you for having me. I feel like I'm really in the room with the brainiacs. So I appreciate that very much. So with this talk is about educating licensed healthcare professionals. So everyone already has their specialty, be it a physician or their credential as a physician, a nurse, a physical therapist. And now they're going to get their continuing education for relicensure and are for learning whatever it is they are interested in learning. So that's what we're talking about doing here. And some of the issues when we look at some of the methods for wound prevention and management education Academic is really one of the perfect settings for the healthcare professionals for introduction to chronic wounds. And I was so wonderful to hear what we just heard and what's happening in academia for our physicians because we depend on our physicians to give us good orders. And if they don't give us good orders, then we have problems and so do our patients and residents. So that's one of the benefits of academia. However, there are some challenges because I do believe this is an undervalued specialty at the academic level, would you agree with me that people think wound care, why do I need anything, know anything about wound care? I'm, I'm gonna be a, a geriatrician, why do I need wound care? And there's limited chronic wound education in most healthcare training programs across the continuum of training except for physical therapy and I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Resident and residence, residencies and fellowships. This is an excellent setting for preparing the future chronic wound care specialist. And Bill's going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But there's a limited number of these residencies or fellowships for the practitioners to go to, for even for the physical therapists to go to, or the nurses. It's not viewed, again, as an exciting specialty by most students. And there are a limited number of healthcare professionals who are competent to lead and train in the wound management residencies or fellowships. On the job training, that's where I got my first wound care experience. In physical therapy training 40 years ago, there were no wound care courses. So I had to do on the job training and then find some continuing education to help me. So when we look at on the job training, there's limited number of mentors in the specific care settings to lead and train and bring someone up on this very important and difficult specialty. This is not an easy specialty. And the other thing is we have outdated our questionable practices regarding the standards of care. And the standards of care and wound care, like every other specialty, changes as we learn more information. So someone has to stay up to speed on what these changes are. We look at continuing education, which is where my where I'm coming from primarily. So this is allows for us to do focus teaching and training. When you're in a residency or when you're in academia, you have a very narrow focus sometimes in what it is you're doing. In continuing education, your focus can broaden and it's a great place for all of us to become more competent in whatever it is we wanna do. Continuing education also reaches the largest audience and one of the really neat things about it is the attendees usually have an interest. It's not always that they're just going to get their continuing education for relicensure. For wound care, most of the people that have ever come to my courses have had a genuine interest in this, either to teach, lead, or do wound management in some way. However, there is limited methods for follow-up to assess the evaluation and what types of changes that have happened in practice and outcomes. And we need a methodology for measuring that. And right now, we don't have a great methodology. So a little bit about my journey. I'm a physical therapist. I have a bachelor's and a doctorate in physical therapy and a master's in exercise physiology, prevention, and wellness. And I'm also board certified as an exercise expert for aging adults, of which I am one, and take it very seriously. And I have a passion for educating healthcare providers in wound management and wound prevention and management so they can get better outcomes for their patients and residents. So to train the healthcare provider gives me the satisfaction that I've made a difference for that patient. I used to do it one patient at a time. Now I try to do it by educating as many clinicians as I can so they can go back and take care of their patients and get better outcomes. This journey began in the early uh, 1990s and I was searching for clinicians to help teach me and I found some. I started uh, out in Torrance, California, 
with um, Carrie Sussman, who's a physical therapist that started uh, a program there. And then I followed people like Luther Cloth and Joe McCullough, who are phys uh, physical therapists, who were some of my mentors and teachers, and Pam Unger. So I had, had wonderful physical therapy mentors. And then I figured out I had to get out of just physical therapy because physical therapy could not do this by themselves. This is truly interdisciplinary. And we need to respect each other from an interdisciplinary perspective and understand what each profession brings to the table. So I found SAWC in 1999, and I've been here ever since. And I strongly, strongly, strongly think that we need to have an integrated wound prevention and management team to get the best long-term sustainable outcomes. I have no evidence to prove this. It would really be nice to get some evidence on this. I've educated over 10,000 multidisciplinary healthcare professionals in one board preparatory course in the last 15 years. We've had about 10,000 people come through. And it is physicians, nurses, therapists, academia, industry have come through this course. And we do have a little bit of data to share in just a moment. Uh, and each year I train about 1,500 nurses in the long-term care industry. Right now I'm in long-term care and my mission uh, until I retire at this point is to bring the level of education and long-term care on wound prevention and care up because this is one of the few professions that they will say to the treatment nurse. One treatment nurse leaves on Friday. On Monday, they said to a different nurse, you're going to be our treatment nurse. Go forth and change dressings. They've not had one course, one article, one book. They've not even been taught the regulations that CMS insists that you do, and they're told that they are now the treatment nurse. And what they find, universally, everyone I've spoken to, they're like the deer in the headlight because they had no idea it was so comprehensive. And these are the people that are taking care of our most fragile population in this country. So would you think that they need to have their education brought up to another level? What do you think? Yes, and that's my mission right now. So the current professional focus is on elevating the level of wound prevention and care in the long-term care industry. And what you're seeing here, one of the courses I started, I had two courses. I have an education company that I started 20 years ago. I still have that education company, and I have a corporate job. And one of the first courses I started was clinical debridement skills. And this is kinesthetic treat, uh, teaching. So when we do our adult learning and teaching methods, we need to bring in the different methodologies, be it didactic, be, uh, include kinesthetic. That's just, I'm a kinesthetic learner. Who in here is a kinesthetic learner? You do it, you own it. A lot of us are. So, th so we're doing sharp debridement using the, the, the instruments on an animal specimen. When you get, when you do this, this does not give you a, certif a certification. This is simply a certificate of completion. You're not certified to do debridement. Now this person has to go back and get under a mentor and show competency on a person. I'm going to talk a little bit about the wound certification prep course. Uh, I have uh, two colleagues, Dot Weir and Greg Patterson. We developed this course about 15 years ago. I uh, produced the course for 10 years, and I was blessed that uh, Health Management Publication bought the course from us a few years ago, and they continued it and took it to another level that I could never do. And I'm very, very grateful for this. So it's intensive 17-hour course, and it is interdisciplinary for our RNs, our MDs, DOs, DPMs, PTs, PTAs, PAs, for everyone. Industry comes to this course. We like to teach industry because when industry talks to us in our language, we listen more when they talk to us. So this course is in its 15th year, and it is making a difference. Just out of curiosity, anybody in here go to this course? Wow, all right, thank you so much, thank you so much. So there's different statistics, so this is from the board, and this is from the ABWM, this is from the board. The CWCA is for people who do not have um, bachelors, they are for associate degree, this is for associate degree, industry, so forth and so on, and the statistics from the board is they have a 64% pass rate for this particular group. In the CWS, which is for your, uh, anyone who has a bachelor's, a master's, or a doctorate, the pass rate for initial certification is about 60%. This is a fairly low pass rate in general. When I tell somebody that the pass rate for your credential is 60%, they start shaking in their boots. Recertification is 83%. Once you've been through the certification process and then you go forth and do good evidence-based wound care and you come back 10 years later to take your course, 
the pass rate is 83 percent. That's really quite impressive. The uh, CWSP is for the physician level, MD, DO, DPM. So the CWSP, the pass rate is about 80 percent. And I believe that is truly because of the way the practitioner is prepared academically, that they actually have more knowledge going in to the test than some of the other credentials. Now, we do evaluations on this particular course, and we get the results from the evaluations. That's what we have right now. So there, this is a accumulation of several years of uh, health management publication. Actually, it's not health management publication, NACME, which is the education arm of health management publications. They're very, very strict. Believe me, I was taken off the planning panel because I work for industry, and they're very, very strict. So this is their stats, and they said, and this is looking at the nurses, the physicians, and the therapists, 99% said that the course increased their confidence, 98 said the course increased their competence, 98% said the course increased their knowledge, 99 it met their educational needs, 92 rated the faculty knowledge and expertise as excellent, that was disappointing. 99 said they referred the course to a friend, and 70, now this, was, this, this statistic was really important. 75% said they intended to make changes in their clinical practice. And one of the th reasons I think this is uh, uh, interesting because we have people who are reserting. So they've been a board certified wound specialist for 10 years. So they're probably not gonna change their practice. So this statistic is, is not very, it's not, these are very, soft statistics, may I say that? All right, so when we think about educating from an interdisciplinary perspective, what is interdisciplinary education? It's this educational approach in which two or more disciplines collaborate in the learning process with the goal of fostering interprofessional interactions that enhance the practice of each discipline. Such interdisciplinary education is based on mutual understanding and respect for the actual and potential contributions of the discipline, and we need to respect each other and bring the disciplines in so that we're not sitting in our silos. We have to get out of our silos to get the best outcomes. So the interdisciplinary wound care model, you have your patient and your family who should be at the head of the team, actually. You have your practitioners, our MDs, DOs, DPMs. You have your nurse, uh, your RNs. Uh, practitioner, my NPs are in the practitioner level advanced practice nurses. You, then you have your wound specialist. Just because you have a physician and a nurse does not mean that either one of those are a wound specialist and really know what they're doing. It takes special training to know what you're doing. Dietitians are part of the team, of course, pharmacists. Your nursing assistant, your CNA in long-term care is a big deal, big deal. So we all need to collaborate and interpret the findings and put together the best care plan. Sometimes we have to negotiate priorities, and this is the best model for a wound care team. So when we look at validating the extent of impactful outcomes from CE, it's difficult. CE does a good job of measuring the participation. Were you there? Did you, uh, are you satisfied? Did you get the learning you want? That's a great process. But we need to, for the future, change how we measure some of this. We need to measure the, the impact on professional competence and performance and patient or community health. What's happening in our community and, and, the, and what's happening with our outcomes for that particular patient? So some considerations for strengthening the CE quality outcomes is to um, strengthen, uh, when we're looking at our professional de development, you want to incorporate a high quality needs assessment. One of the first things I do when someone says, Pamela, would you come do an all day course for all of our nurses for this corporation in long term care? The first thing I do is I send out a needs assessment. What do you think you need to know? I take the regulations from CMS and I go through what they have to know according to the regulations. See, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know their own regulations. So I put out a needs assessment first before we start writing the plan for the education. We, so we need ongoing feedback, interactive teaching training models with multiple media and educational methods, and we need to include information that's contextually relevant to each healthcare provider's professional practice as we're thinking about doing this. We wanna encourage and attend interdisciplinary wound prevention management education ourselves. We want to promote collaborative practice, encourage understanding of the ethical issues affecting specialty of wound prevention and management. We are not funded oftentimes the way we need to be funded 
to provide the standards of care. If I don't provide the standards of care in long-term care, I can get what's called an F-tag, and it can cost me thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars for that particular nursing, nursing home or, or, um, or corporation. So it's, and we, it's, it's unethical and it's below the standards of care to do some of the things that we can't do because we don't have the funding for it. And we're being penalized in long-term care. We want to improve practice through activities that link the continuing education to the quality improvement, to patient safety, and to improve patient care and clinical outcomes. So in summary, we want to recognize that knowledge is unbounded and potential discoveries lie outside our compartmentalized structures for formal and continuing education. When I first started this course, my courses, the first one, as I said, was clinical debridement skills, and this one, I love it, keeping the foot attached to the leg. That was the other one. But it was started off with physical therapists. I only did that for two years and recognized I've got to get the nurses in here. And then finally we figured out how to get our physicians in our courses. We had to have CMEs, so that was another challenge. So we want to learn from and teach different disciplines, not stay in our silos. We want an interdisciplinary team approach that should f facilitate optimal wound closure and healing outcomes to the patient's tolerance and their abilities in the most cost-effective manner and at the fastest rate possible. So the best interdisciplinary teams are where the team members communicate openly and frequently regarding the patient's wound and overall health condition. We have to look at the comorbidities. As Carrie Sussman said in 1997, you have to look at the whole patient, not just the hole in the patient. My treatment nurses in long-term care are looking at the hole in the patient. And they're wondering why they're getting F tags. And we wanna also the best interdisciplinary teams look at the outcomes of their interventions, they look at their successes, they look at their failures and determine what they need to do for the future. And these are some of the references that I have, and including my own. Thank you very much. Okay. And for our last uh, speaker of the session, um, Dr. Bill Ennis is no stranger uh, to education. He is board certified in general surgery, vascular surgery, and family medicine. Uh, he is also has a certificate of qualification in undersea and hyperbaric medicine, as well as a master's in medical management. Dr. Ennis has developed a fellowship for physicians um, intending to specialize in wound care um, and practice wound care as a specialty. Welcome, Dr. Ennis. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to share a few things with you about the, the journey that we've had over about the past 10 or 12 years uh, at the American College of Wound Healing and uh, Tissue Repair. Um, so it, it ties nicely, and Lisa put this together, I think, in, a, in an interesting way so that we, we kind of build along. Um, Pam's last comments were, were mission critical. Just because there's a doctor or a nurse there doesn't mean the doctor or the nurse know anything about wound care. And um, that became really apparent. I think it was probably the same year that I showed up at SAWC, Pam, that, that probably you did, that um, back in those days you could count the physicians that were in the room, um, and they were the same five people every time, you know, and it became readily apparent that we were woefully uh, inadequately prepared uh, to do this, this area. So let me go over the college, where wound education is currently, the fellowship concept. I'm going to talk briefly about something that's fairly disruptive, which is an online fellowship opportunity, um, and I'm going to talk about why we think that that's going to be necessary. Um, what the goal of ACGME um, standardization and approval for our field and, and some things about the future to it. So the mission of this college, it's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit um, to improve public health, leading the growth of a new integrated field of medicine and surgery dedicated to the practice of modern wound healing and tissue repair. And the reason this mission is important as a statement to, to read is the goal and the mission was um, to grow um, a new field. And the mission really hasn't changed in the, in the past 10 years, although there's been a lot of um, noise, white noise, and, and, and recommendations and opportunities to deviate from that mission. 
Um, we have not. Um, we have not done a lot of the things that a lot of groups have, have gone uh, kind of gone into, although many of those things are necessary, that we didn't feel that that was something that we had the bandwidth for nor, nor the interest in. And the vision is comprehensive education of wound care clinicians, and you can read through the rest, but it's not a specific therapy, it's not a specific treatment, it's not a specific option, right? It's about what, what's best for the patient, and that's going to be iterative, right? So this, a mission and vision statement, um, you're wearing my MBA hat for a second, it needs to be sustainable over time. Right? It, can't, it can't reflect, uh, if it's going to be strong and if it's going to be an important organization, it has to um, philosophically um, reflect really what's going on in the space. Not today we have these products and we have these things in the exhibit hall and 10 years from now we're all going to be sitting here with wearables that are going to be uploaded to the cloud that will inform us exactly how we're doing. Right? Well, we need to be able to do that too for wound care. So, so to put that type of technology onto a mission or a vision would make no sense. Currently, wound care education is abysmal, right? There's a patchwork of courses, there's societies, there's on-the-job training, and, and, and Pam um, went through some of that. Um, but it's really great to hear about um, geriatrics because that's a, an area that um, our, our college has looked to because you're, you're actually the only ACGME um, board that actually has wound care in its core content requirements. I found that really fascinating, so I've, I've learned more about ACGME than I ever frankly wanted to know about, and I now know about what every subject matter is, and the, and the geriatrics folks have identified this many, many years ago. Um, there was a paper that was about 10 years ago, though, that unfortunately showed a pre and post exam in which they still felt woefully undertrained to go then deal with pressure ulcers in those institutions, right? So um, it's not just enough to identify it as a core content, it's that it has to be actionable, right? We have to execute on that on that vision and, and, um, and we certainly haven't done it in the rest of the fields. And, and Mark Granick from New Jersey put this out now many years ago, but it really hasn't changed. It's about nine hours of didactic, and except for your place where there's obviously more, but everybody else is getting nine or less um, in their training. So why seek um, a specialty? You know, there's an argument in healthcare and in medical education that there's too much specialization, and that's one of the problems, right? There's this constant personalized medicine versus pop health, population health um, um, paradox, right? How do, we, how do we address that? And by using too many specialties, the, the feeling is that somehow we lose the overall global care of a patient. So there's pros and cons to, to doing it. Um, but it's to improve patient care, create and disseminate new knowledge, um, establish credibility and recognition, and f one of the big things that we felt at the college is this is one of the biggest problems we have. We have a PR issue. Um, when we go to Medicare, when we go to the FDA, when we apply for grants even, uh, people aren't really quite sure who we are, who, what, who we represent, what we do, what does wound care really mean. Um, so we needed an infrastructure to support the training and re research, and then I know one of Lisa's important uh, concerns is that not only do we have to train practitioners, but we have to train the future innovators in this space for research moving forward for organizations like the Wound Healing Society, right? So we really need this really broad uh, number of different types of training programs um, to approach that. So if you try to attack the entire thing, you end up doing nothing, right? Because it's, it's too broad of a, of a concept and too much to do. So what we did is we developed a curriculum about 10, 10 years ago. Um, we needed a willing and able uh, university uh, to, to adopt it and to support it. Uh, we needed a GME department within that university to then support the fellow and make them part of the college. Now these are non-ACGME funded fellowships, so we do not take from the funding from the medical education for the rest of the university. And I can tell you that that was the easiest meeting I've ever been to in my life. I went in to uh, present to the body of GME, there's about 50 people in the room, all the other um, specialties uh, were, were there, and they had looked at my proposal and they were getting ready to vote. And one hand went up in the back of the room and said, uh, let's just be blunt, um, whose fellows and residents are going to be reduced uh, by you starting this program? And I said, oh, nobody's. We don't have funding. We're bringing our own funding in. Any further questions? No. All approved? Yeah, everybody was like, wound care is great because we weren't taking anything from anybody, right? So um, that also, is there'll be an unintended consequence of moving ourselves into 
professional ACGME approval, right? Because now we have a different um, methodology. We had to interview and accept a fellow. Who's this poor soul? Hi, would you like to come to our university? We don't have a test. We don't have certification. You will not be board certified in anything, but you're going to spend a year really working insanely hard for very little money. And at the end of the year, we're going to put something together that says, you did it. You came out of the University of Illinois. Um, so the interesting thing is there's a lineup of people who want to do it because they see the job opportunities and they see the absence of well-trained physicians. So they're not concerned about it for right now. We needed a consortia of like-minded institutions, which we have now been able to do across five other institutions and then launch. Uh, we had a strategy session with a group of folks and then we had to go create it, hire somebody, bring them in and do it. And these are some of the um, rotations that we currently have. Um, the curriculum has been iterative. It now has a core set of curriculum and an elective set. It's a one-year, 12-month rotating program. It mirrors all other GME-approved programs in a university. So there's a call schedule. Uh, the university's answering service knows who, who's there. It's inpatient. It's outpatient. It's subacute. And the, the physician then follows the patients from, uh, so for example, when they're on vascular surgery service, they're really not in there doing an endo leak aneurysm repair. Uh, they would only be going into that operating room for a distal reconstructive bypass on a patient that was from the wound clinic. So we attempt to connect the dots, unlike when f those of you that are docs that did a plastic rotation when you're a general surgery resident, you do whatever's on the service. That's not really the goal and objective of a fellowship. It's to hone the skills specifically on what you would want. And so you can see the rest of the areas. And, there, and there's probably no end to the number of subjects we could have added, um, but we have to keep it within a, in a single academic year. We did a lot of surveys and a lot of research on that. Uh, people have loans to repay, jobs to start. It's, it's really unrealistic to do that. Um, to get credit by the uh, ACGME. So to be considered an actual fellowship that is recognized, one has to have a distinct body of medical knowledge, which we feel uh, we've been able to prove, a body of practicing physicians that are already in that role, availability of formal training in a professional society. So we have met the criteria and have met with ACGME on multiple applications and um, literally will be submitting the application within the next three weeks to, to that organization. Um, so then it really will be, the ball will be in someone else's court to determine where we are with our level of uh, professional um, approval. So we've done eight fellows, the other universities have done five, so that's about 13, 14 people have completed this process. And the big answer is, so what? 14 people. Given the absence of health care and the absence of wound care, this is clearly not the answer to the, the, the workforce requirements. So clearly what we've been looking at now is an ability to professionally train other individuals who, do, who are mid-career um, and don't have the time or ability to take out and do a one-year fellowship. So we're looking at an experiential uh, online program. It's fairly disruptive in that there's a lot of filming um, so you would actually almost be virtually doing rounds with us. We're filming clinic exams. We're filling, filming procedures. Um, so it's a very different um, approach. That should be um, first modules rolled out probably within 12 months. Um, the university-based, again, is, is typical stuff, journal club, elective rotations, didactic. Um, the, the one thing I will say, and to the geriatric point, is the fa that we're in our eighth year at the university. Um, wound care awareness is up because there's a fellow who now has been, and I've hired all, a bunch of the fellows, so they're all on junior faculty. So the reality is that everybody's like, hey, where's the wound care fellow? They always say, where's the ICU fellow? Where's the ID fellow? Where's this? Where's that resident, right? But if there is no such thing as wound care, then there isn't. And the other thing is the cross-pollination of knowledge. So when the wound care fellow is on a plastic rotation and they're doing a component separation on an abdomen, they will start making recommendations about dressings or closure. And all of a sudden, you're starting to get people on the vascular saying, do you think we should close this? Or should we put negative pressure on this incision? And that dialogue was never there, right? And so this doesn't happen the day you open a program. Trust me, it takes multiple years to get the faculty to start to understand and believe into it. You have to have quite a bit of specific things to get this program rolling. Um, I believe you need um, a large patient base. It, it makes no sense to have these folks 
waste a year of their time and then expose them to you know five people in a clinic once a week, right? And so our group last year saw 13,000 patient visits. So there's plenty of patient visits for them to see. Uh, we do over 200 direct admissions to the hospital from our own group. So they manage the inpatients, they manage them. We have a dedicated 25 bed um, subacute unit uh, that they are responsible for as well. I believe, and to Pam's comment, you know, you got to have a PT department that's doing. We're heavily invested in PT wound care and have my whole career. Um, WOCNs, the wound care nurses, we've created wound champions on every floor. We participate in the prevalence and incidence studies. Our wound care fellows on the quality assurance program for wound care. So it makes you part of the fabric of the hospital by doing this type of thing. This is Dr. Gosha Plummer's first um, award. I, I tell you, sitting in the audience for this, when the chairman of surgery went up and said the next um, graduate is uh, from the Department of Wound Healing and Tissue Repair, and collectively the entire audience, you could just see them all going, who? I'm sorry, what department? You know, and Dr. Plummer has to go up and I gave her her first certificate and it was, a, a, I think it was an important day for, for wound care. These are the other programs um, um, that, are, that are out there and uh, taking in uh, folks. And what are we doing at the college? We're trying to partner with other folks. We're now very, very involved in patient-centered uh, outcomes research. This is um, for anybody who visits us in Chicago. We have an annual meeting in, in October, but if you're in Chicago for any other reason, um, go to the International Surgical Sciences Museum. We've actually created um, a two gallery um, exhibit on the history of wound care, modern wound care, and partnered uh, with them. And it's been a, another great ability for students and medical students to come through some things we've done with the American College of Surgery um, jointly. So in closing, I would say that um, this is a huge, long uh, process. Um, we're uncertain as to where the, you know, the ultimate goal, um, uh, it's up into administrative hands as far as where does it go. Um, but what we're going to need to do is rapidly replicate. And so once we get approval, we can't have five fellowships. We need to have 25 fellowships. And our thinking about these folks that do this full one year is that they're probably not going to be wound generalists, but they're going to probably go into leadership roles and hopefully do some of the things that Lisa's looking for and be the kind of folks that um, really push the field. And then it's a larger workforce that we're talking about with the online uh, training until we get our numbers up and fill the demands that are in the marketplace for um, well-trained docs. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to talk on the panel. Thank you. We'd like to open this up for an interactive discussion, so please um, use the microphone so that everybody can hear your questions. I'm going to start it off um, for all of you. How do you measure competence? Competence. Pam? How do you measure competence? In nursing and physical therapy, one of the ways that you assess competence is you watch that person do a particular, maybe it's a sharp debridement skill, maybe it's starting a pick line or something like that. So someone else who is considered competent <laughs> measures how well that person does competency, and I think it's a very nebulous thing. So in, in residency, there's a, a, every rotation you're on, you're, you're evaluated, and it's fairly um, standardized. So we really essentially just adopted the, the Department of Surgery's um, rotational competencies. I would argue that those aren't that accurate, Lisa, and, I, and, I, and I, I know that we have a bunch of issues even when we do our medical student evaluations on a monthly basis. There seems to be a lot of quick check the boxes, and, and I think the same things happen with, um, uh, w with the residents. So is it a good system? No. Is it the system that everybody's using in College of Medicine? Yes. And I would, I would kind of echo the uh, sentiment of Dr. Scarborough that in terms of if you're looking at a skill, I think it's relatively easy, except it might be the blind leading the blind if the person who's measuring the competence is not competent. So how do you make sure of that? But I think that, um, so a skill, you know, you have steps and it's easy. Uh, as a geriatric medicine fellowship director, not only are you, know, you have competencies, but then there's also these milestones where everything's been moving in that direction. Um, and so I think, you know, looking at, I think it's definitely an area to explore. You know, if you think about when we submit proposals to our national organizations, they ask this stuff. 
you know, what is the competency gap and, and other gaps? So it's, how can you even answer that question if maybe we're not doing that great job of measuring it? And I'd love to hear what other people are doing in the audience in terms of looking at competency and how they might go about it at their institution. Um, with regard to the con question of competence, I, I wouldn't undersell the, the idea of cognitive competence. The American Board of Surgery, as well as the American Board of Plastic Surgery, requires an in-face interview where you're given situations that you have to talk your way out of, where clearly you've gone down the wrong path with a patient you're presenting in your portfolio with the plastic surgeons, and you have to recognize that there's a time for humility as well as a time for uh, cleverness. Um, that said, with technique, it's hard to walk it back. So I think that there's room for both. With regard to your call to arms for creating a fleet of wound doctors, those of us who had to beat the door down in order to do what we want to do in, in an institution and who are continually treated as the redheaded stepchild, even though my red hair is now gray. Uh, there is a pathway that I would request or recommend, and that is a grandfathering in uh, with regard to several specialties like emergency room medicine, uh, certificates in critical care, hand surgery, undersea med uh, and hyperbaric medicine. At the outset, those who were practicing for a long period of time who could demonstrate competency in a written test were welcomed into the fold in order to attain critical mass quickly while maintaining standards. Yes, so totally agree with that, and that's um, going to be within the domain of ACGME and ABMS when that happens. And in fact, one of the, it's, got, it's really not up to us to make a lot of those decisions. And one of the reasons uh, why a hyperbaric had the problem it did is it, it went out too fast. And so the grandfather period ended, and then there was no mechanism for a physician to become certified without doing a full year of fellowship. So that was actually something that was strategically thought about and held back by my organization so that we felt that we were in the time, because that clock starts ticking by those organizations and we're not able to slow that process down. But to your point, obviously, it, it, I, I should have stated that, that will be something that obviously will, will occur. Uh, I have a question about the uh, physician subspecialty. You were talking about physicians, but I heard a lot about surgery. Are your, are your fellows surgeons or non-surgeons also? So we, what we've created, created is a new genetic species and we're calling it a hybridization of an internist and a surgeon. Actually, no surgery resident has been in my fellowship. They've all been from family med or internal med. Um, and the people that come in the front door of that program don't even remotely look like the people that come out the back end of that fellowship. It has really been a cool process to watch. Um, we ask our surgical colleagues to um, give these folks the education and the knowledge that you feel necessary for you to feel comfortable having them on your case. What if they were following your open abdomen with negative pressure or whatever it was? What would you hope that they knew? You know, there's always this talk about, well, ID doesn't know anything. I'm a surgeon. They can't do it. Well, what if you had the opportunity to create this human being? What would you want that person to know? So from right now, they're coming from family med and internal med, but clearly we see the, if, if the ACGME goes the way we want, um, multiple portals of entry, very similar to pain, and I would say the prototype for this is hospice and palliative medicine, who really were brilliant in the way they designed it, and there's, I think, nine portals of entry. That's good to hear. I, I want to just point out that there is another uh, fellowship that wasn't meant, that you didn't mention, that just graduated in Rochester, uh, wound specialist uh, from a fellowship, and, Excellent. and uh, there's, there is another body of, uh, of, of, of another physician board yes, there is. that I'm a part of, uh, the American Board of Wound Medicine and Surgery, that has a board of physicians. Yes, we're um, well aware. 
Yeah, I just think it'd be great to work together. We submitted a memorandum of understanding for that organization to sign off on, but that, that didn't happen. Ah, okay. So we, we, we agree with you and we wanted to go down that pathway. Next question. Hello, hi. Um, first off, uh, your program sounds, uh, your fellowship sounds ab absolutely terrific. And I'm glad to know that um, there are those of us out there doing those types of things. But my question comes from um, a person that's relatively new to wound care, uh, that's coming from a primary care setting, transitioning into wound care. I'm seeing a lot of that happening out here in the, in the battlefield of medicine where a lot of your, well, some of your primary care doctors are, are gravitating towards wound care. My question is this, for those of us who are new to wound care from a primary care setting, what's out there now to make us better? Because that's where a lot of your in the field uh, physicians are coming from. They're coming from a primary care setting. Um, so what can we do at this point, being new to wound care, to be better and more prepared for wound care? I have an answer for you. When we do the wound certification prep course, we go through every credential and we ask, also ask the question, who's sitting for a board certification? Those who are sitting at the board raise their hand. And then the other question is, who's coming in here because you need to learn more about wound care to be competent at whatever your specialty is. So about a third of the people that come through the wound certification prep course are going through this intensive 17 hour program and they come out the other end of this program and come up and tell us, now this is anecdotal, but they say this is, you know, this is the, the best thing I could ever have done is to come to this course in this amount of time. So about a third of the people that come through are literally coming through for exactly what you're talking about. And so there is one avenue and then the other avenue is finding other continuing education, going to places like where you are right now, SAWC. You're here and then we have all these tracks for a new wound care clinician to get into. And they usually do their tracks based on the different etiologies and also the level of competency or the level of knowledge. So there are several different places. And also, if you want to go online, there's all kinds of online free education that some of the industry partners put out and they have an education arm. There's a, something called Wound Source, which is also gives you all kinds of free education that you can do online. So you can do it from an online perspective. You can t come take a course like our course. And then, of course, if you can find you a mentor, if you can find you a mentor that's already board certified as a wound specialist or gone through a fellowship, then that could also help you. I have two questions. Um, one is for our last speaker um, and the previous speaker at the microphone. Who funds your fellowships? Um, we completely fund the fellowship through the Department of Surgery. So it's on my budget. So my group, it's generated through patient care and through the Department of Surgery. So it is internally funded. Yeah. So yeah, I have a fellow, but I fund my fellow myself. Right. I was wondering if there was so other sources of funding other than my own. Now, if you find any, please call me <laughs> immediately. Because every year that's a conversation with my chairman. Remind me again why we're paying for this, he says. So. Okay. And the second question I had was for our first speaker um, who um, made that lovely curriculum. Um, how, how do you uh, anticipate getting that curriculum more into the medical student? Into the, uh, I do one hour to the medical yeah. students, that's it. And I don't think they get anything else. So, so, so this, um, it's actually something recently, I'd say in the last few weeks, has been developing that's really exciting. So remember how I, and a lot of the medical schools out there are doing a total redesign, right? It's not the two years, uh, two years lecture, two years clinical. Um, a lot of them are doing a lot of interdisciplinary work and you're getting to your clinicals earlier. So go back to the medical school to see what, how everything's um, set up. And I actually noticed, I, we had a meeting about geriatrics and education and then I'm looking at the surgery corps clerkship and I'm like, whoa, there's a box of wound care in the surgery corps clerkship. Who's that clerkship director? Turns out to be a really fabulous vascular surgeon. And she and I have been working together. We're now between their preclinical doing some lecture and then integrating okay online con content. Um, but now we're gonna be progressing 
to making a much more robust online kind of program. And then on top of that, recognizing wound care doesn't belong just in surgery. Um, and so what's really great because of the medical school redesign, they have these things that are called intercessions, which are these very intense interdisciplinary sessions. Geriatrics has one, and um, she approached the people who run these and say, we think wound care should be one, and they're like, absolutely. I'm literally having a meeting in two weeks to talk about this. So going back, first you need to know where is it right now, and you might be it. Um, finding a, a champion to partner because you you can't do it by yourself um, and because I'm a hundred percent clinical VA with an academic appointment she's a hundred percent university and has all these nice resources so we and not but I have the curriculum so between the two of us can come up with something really fabulous but to your point, um, Foy and I have talked about this we have islands of excellence in a sea of mediocrity. <laughs> and to try to bring it more generally to the nation um, so that we can infiltrate the curriculum. This is something the uh, Wound Healing Society Education Committee has been trying to do for years and years and years is figure out how to get on the curriculum, which is jam-packed. And I think that our only option is something that's online in bite-sized pieces that doesn't take up a lot of time. Um, and then my other question is, is simulation coming? I mean, so, so you operate on pig's feet and you teach on pig's feet, but pig's feet don't bleed. And the most important thing to learn is how to stop bleeding <laughs> and what the anatomy is. Yes, yeah, so we have a, um, a multi-million dollar sim lab that was just, just opened this past academic year. Um, and in the department, again, this is again using the surgical uh, department to head that up. We actually have a program called SEED, which is Surgical Education Advanced um, Diagnostics. They, these are kids that are in PGY-1 that want to go into surgery, and they already go through now a wound care sim um, portion with us. And in all the um, uh, pre-surgical learnings, wound care has been set up. So companies come in with equipment, devices, there's a wet lab, and then up in the debridement lab. Um, it's, it's a start. It's nothing like as good as the, the Da Vinci systems that we've got set up to show them how to do lap, col you know, to do coles, et cetera, but it's, it's coming for debridement as well. Hi, Jose from Mexico. Just wanted to quickly share our experience. Uh, we, developed, we understood that the problem with the ignorance in wound care came from medical school and nursing schools. So we worked with the schools and we got wound care back into the curriculum of the schools. And that developed into a master's because all these students saw the value of learning these skills. And we have now graduated close to 300 masters in wound care uh, students from nursing and medical schools. And we then moved on to have a, a clinical fellowship for physicians as well as, as Dr. Ennis did. So that has really changed the face of wound care in the country because we have now 300 people working and doing things uh, properly. Thank you. Uh, can you come back real quick? <laughs> Jose, sorry. Yes. Uh, so I think that's fabulous. I'm really curious because there are so many, and I don't know how many medical schools there are in Mexico, like how were you able to, like who do you talk to that has, that would look at all the different medical schools and make this happen? There's nothing that would necessarily except for maybe ACGME, now that I think about it, um, that where that would come from. So I was curious about that process a little bit. We went directly to the deans of two of the most important medical okay. and, and nursing schools because it's co-ed, doctors and nurses together learning wound care, which I find fascinating. And uh, we told them what the problem was. And they bought into the idea. And the first two years, it was an elective, like it wasn't mandatory. Mm -hmm. But then the results were so good that all the students wanted to take it and it became part of the of the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions and I'm sure that you can find more answers from our panel and um, we have to adjourn now. I don't know how to talk to you about this. We have a good seminar, but I don't I don't know how to I'm like what are